quick announcement, guys. I uh, don't know if you're checking out my uh, sweatshirt here. Uh, well, you can't see all of it. It says, it's not about the virus. And I'm going to lean back. It's about control. <laughs> this is from my new merchandise store. And, you know, we have a germaphobe in the family, as I think you know. And she's like, Ganesh, I think it is about the virus. There is a virus, you know. And I'm like, yeah, I do know. But the point here is that for the Democrats and for the left, the virus is a pretext. It's an excuse to establish what? Control. Anyway, if you want to check out my store, uh, it's got uh, mugs, it's got hats, it's got t-shirts, it's got sweatshirts, it's the full gamut. I'm going sort of, I won't say full Calvin Klein on you, but there's some cool stuff you'd want to check out. And a lot of this stuff was really going to make you laugh. So go to shop.dineshdesouza.com. Shop now, uh, Biden's uh, named a new nominee for the Supreme Court um, and uh, Judge Jackson, Katanji Jackson. Not even entirely sure how to say her name, but I'll be checking her record out and I'll talk about her nomination uh, next week. Today, we're going to talk about the Ukraine. Really going to show how this um, combination of woke politics, identity politics, all the kind of nonsense that has overtaken our culture makes it difficult for understand very simple power politics on the world stage. Uh, identity politics is also forcing the Biden administration to, um, not forcing, but driving the Biden administration to suspend an anti-espionage program against China. What? I'm going to explore why women who have traditionally been conservative in their voting habits for decades uh, now vote more progressive. Why is that? And um, Toward the end, I'm going to talk about the famous tryst between Paolo and Francesca in Dante's Divine Comedy. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. America needs this voice. The times are crazy. In a time of confusion, division, and lies, we need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. The uh, battle for Kiev is on and Russian forces are pushing toward the capital, uh, the Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. And according to U.S. intelligence estimates, it's not going to take them long to get it. They have deployed a ferocious uh, force, 150,000 troops. They've got superior weaponry. And so you see all these uh, grim pictures of the uh, Ukrainians in bomb shelters and kind of hunkering down. But um, according to uh, re news reports and apparently according to intelligence estimates, it's only going to be three to four days before the Russians are in Kiev and Putin is having, you know, breakfast in, in Kiev. Now, what to me is really disturbing, and this is really shows the shift in our culture, is the way in which uh, various figures in the media, in entertainment, even in politics, are talking about this in a manner that suggests a complete lack of seriousness about foreign policy, a lack of understanding, a lack of comprehension, and a kind of jejun, inane projection of local uh, concerns that have to do with political correctness and other kinds of nonsense onto um, Putin and onto Russia and onto a global stage that doesn't really see things this way. I'll talk about power politics in a moment, but let me just read a few things that I've been seeing and hearing. Here's Joy Behar. She's a little upset about what's happening in Ukraine. She says, this could kind of shake up the map of Europe and Italy. She goes, I I've been planning a vacation to Italy. This, this could, this could, this could interfere with that. Uh, this is Joy Behar. Apparently, it all comes down to Joy Behar's vacation. Uh, then we have a guy, um, uh, also on social media, um, an academic of some sort, and he goes, well, you know, Putin, uh, yeah, where does he get the arrogance to do this kind of thing? It's probably because of white supremacy. Putin's white. Could he really do this if he were black or if he were brown? And I'm thinking to myself, how 
out of it is this type of analysis. I mean, this is, it's one thing to, you know, talk like this at like Oberlin or Bowdoin College, but to put this out when we're discussing a, in, in a, a serious international event, I mean, people are even talking, addressing Putin directly. I've seen some videos to this effect, and they're talking to Putin like he's some woke graduate of like Yale, and that he, you know, cares about how you feel or how, um, you know, the Ukrainians feel or how the world, I keep hearing the world will not forgive you, the world, uh, as if Putin is sitting around, like, yeah, well, what, is, what does the world think about what I'm doing? This does not enter into his brain at all. Here is uh, John Kerry, our climate czar, from really just a few days ago. Listen to this. He goes, now northern Russia is thawing and his infrastructure, Putin's infrastructure, is at risk and the people of Russia are at risk. So I hope President Putin will help us to stay on track with respect to what we need to do on the climate. On the climate. Uh, and here's the New York Times um, talking about the fighting in Ukraine. And what gets me is the second sentence. The first one is kind of normal. The fighting in Ukraine's east is forcing a mass migration to the west uh, that is crowding mass transit centers and trains and jamming roads. But then comes this little rhetorical uh, classic, this gem, quote, Video images of the large number of Ukrainians on the move show few signs of face coverings. <laughs> <laughs> Even as the country is just getting past a record high point in its infection rate. So the Times is a little worried that, you know, not only are the, are the mask requirements being ignored, but what about social distancing, guys? You're all in a bomb shelter. You're abnormally close to each other. And I think to myself, you know, it actually makes me uncomfortable to read this kind of nonsense because it is just so detached from reality. It is, it's the mark of a certain kind of ideological uh, derangement. Now, the left has been, uh, uh, trying to portray conservatives as somehow pro-Putin. You know, these guys are for Putin. No, we're not for Putin. None of us are for Putin. We want the Ukrainians to hold out. We want the Ukrainians to win. Uh, we're not for Putin. Putin's a thug. But here's my point. I have a certain kind of grudging respect for Putin for the simple reason that he's a thug that understands his country's interests and he's a thug that understands the use of power. I'd say exactly the same thing, by the way, of China Xi. These are thugs, but they're thugs who pay careful attention to how do you get things accomplished. Uh, we can't really say the same thing about Biden. The problem here uh, with the Ukraine is a bigger and deeper one, and that is that the United States has played very poorly uh, the game of power politics. It's almost as if we egged on the Ukraine. Oh yeah, the United States is the world's sole superpower. No worries, Ukraine. Why don't you guys come into NATO and, you know, oh, together we will, we will, um, Putin's days are numbered anyway. Russia is going down, down, down. So you can be part of the winning team. Now, the problem with all this is it igno ignores a simple fact. Ukraine is a very tiny dot right next to a big Russian bear. And Russia is going to try to make sure that the dots around it are subordinate to Russia. And so the question is, has the United States lulled Ukraine into a kind of illusion? Join our side, we'll be there for you, when the US and even Western Europe had no intention of directly coming to the rescue of Ukraine, as we are not now doing. I saw a ridiculous um, posting that says that the US is now hoping to help to train um, Ukrainian forces, quote, remotely. What, training Ukrainian forces by Zoom call? Hey guys, listen, let me give you, let us give you seven helpful tips as you take on the Russians. So this is unseriousness that seems to be permeating our society. No wonder, here we are, the world's sole superpower, at least we have been until now. This is not a conflict I think we're likely to win. Biden even knows that. He's basically saying, we, we don't really, we're not going to be using missiles. We're going to be using sanctions. But you know what? Sanctions can just be as terrifying as missiles. And I don't think there's anyone, not even Biden himself at the end of the day, who believes it. Debbie and I just got a call from Mike Lindell a day or two ago, and he's like, hey, Dinesh, we, I want to support your movie. I want to get it out there. I want to make sure everybody sees it. So this is awesome. I love Mike Lindell and the way he's willing to get behind stuff and really push it and all the risks that he's taken and the price he's paid for his convictions. Now, let's support Mike Lindell every which way we can. He wants to make it easy for you to be a super shopper, just like Debbie and I are. How? By giving you great deals. For example, his Giza Dream bedsheets. 
60% off, as low as $39.99. Plus, with any purchase using a promo code Dinesh, you'll get a free copy of Mike's inspirational book. Mike is also offering up to 66% off on the other products, more than 150 of them. All the MyPillow products come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. Call 800-876-0227, that number, 800-876-0227, or go to MyPillow.com. And to get the discounts, you need to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. The uh, Department of Justice, Biden's Department of Justice, is shutting down an anti-espionage program aimed at China. Why? Wait till you hear this. Because they're, they've become a little concerned about using racial profiling. They're worried that they're stereotyping the Chinese. Now, um, this to me is pathological behavior. Uh, over the last few years, the United States has been prosecuting uh, various um, scientists who have been kind of in league with China, working for China, and at the same time not disclosing their ties to China. Now, it is possible for researchers to work on behalf of China, but uh, there is a re- disclosure requirement. And so there have been a number of high-profile prosecutions of academics and researchers um, who have made grant applications, but not disclosed, not revealed that they are turning over their information to the Chinese, in fact, ultimately to the Chinese Communist Party. Last December, a jury found the former chair of Harvard's chemistry department, Charles Lieber, guilty about lying to federal officials, filing false tax returns. This is exactly what this DOJ program was aimed at uncovering. Now, it's true that they sometimes have um, uh, had a case that has failed. They dropped all charges against an MIT mechanical engineering professor named Gang Chen, um, who was indicted for concealing his ties to Chinese programs. Um, There's an ongoing case against a guy named Franklin Tao, a University of Kansas chemical engineering professor, and he goes to trial soon. But um, right while this program was humming along and it's aimed at dealing with the real problem, and the problem is that China is aggressively engaged in academic and industrial espionage. So no one denies that simple fact. But the DOJ sort of almost without warning has shut down its program, its law enforcement program, for, for finding and discovering and prosecuting this Chinese, this espionage on behalf of China. And uh, here is uh, Assistant Attorney General for National Security, Matthew Olson. And what he basically says is DOJ will no longer use the framework of the China Initiative, that's the name of this program, to organize or to describe our efforts to counter threats by the PRC, People's Republic of China government. He goes, we are ending the China Initiative. Now, the shocking reason is when he tells you why. And he he basically says, quote, listen to this, I'm now just quoting. By grouping cases under the China Initiative rubric, we help give rise to a harmful perception that the department applies a lower standard to investigate and prosecute criminal conduct related to that country, or we in some way view people with ethnic, racial, or familial ties to China differently. So to translate, to decode, what he's saying is the people we're going after in this program are kind of all Chinese. And we don't want to create the impression we've got anything against the Chinese. So we've got all these people we're indicting and they've got Chinese names. They've got names like Tao and um, and uh, Gang Chen. And so we're a little worried here that we're going to be accused of racial stereotyping. In other words, we're going to be accused of being kind of unwoke. And so we got to shut down this program. Now they say, look, we're not like totally getting rid of it. We're kind of going to sweep it into a kind of a bigger anti and espionage program that kind of involves Russia, Iran, all countries lumped together. This way we can't be accused of singling out the Chinese. So this is how political correctness is killing us. Uh, it's killing legitimate programs aimed at uncovering real threats. Uh, and these real threats become somehow blurred because the people who are supposed to be investigating go, you know what, I that guy's name is Wong. Can we really go after a guy named Wong? Too bad his name isn't Smith. We could then really go after him. Let's discontinue the anti-China initiative uh, and just lump it under some bigger thing. This way we won't be accused of racial insensitivity. How pathetic, how disgusting, and how dangerous. 
Think your homeowner's insurance covers home title fraud? Well, think again. And neither does your common identity theft program. The FBI calls home title fraud one of the fastest growing crimes, which is why you need to go to HomeTitleLock.com, America's leader in home title protection. Here's the problem. The deed to your home is the only document that proves you own it. And, and the deeds to all our homes are now online. So in minutes, a criminal can find and forge your name off the deed to your home and refile as the new owner. Like Jeff, who spent a fortune in legal fees after a thief forged himself onto the deed to Jeff's home and took out loans, and Jeff didn't have home title lock then, but you know what? He does now. HomeTitleLock.com is your peace of mind that the deed to your home is protected. Visit HomeTitleLock.com. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. As I watch the disintegration of these democratic cities, the... Um, the way that their schools have gone into a tailspin, the escalating crime rates. One question that I ask is, you know, are Democrats okay with this? These are the Democrats who are keeping these um, uh, authorities in office, uh, the mayor, the district attorney. And, um, and so are Democrats happy to be living in this kind of cesspool that, has now, that we now call San Francisco, that we now call L.A.? Well, there are some signs that Democrats are kind of waking up. Uh, I mentioned uh, a couple of days ago on the podcast, the San Francisco school board recall. Three leftists on the school board yanked by margins of over 70 percent, uh, in which basically died in the wool Democrats, including, by the way, a lot of ethnic Democrats decide it's time to give these people the boot. Good news. Well, here's some good news out of L.A. There is a big move now to remove, to recall the uh, district attorney. This is uh, George Gascon. This is a guy who has essentially alienated the entire, and I mean the entire law enforcement community. There's a statement just come out from the Los Angeles Association of Deputy District Attorneys. And more than nine out of 10 L.A. prosecutors, according to a survey conducted by this group, approve the recall. They want this guy out. Uh, and the head of the group is talking about why. This is a guy named Eric Siddle. He goes, it has been one year of Gascon's social experiment, an experiment that he says has been, quote, a miserable failure. I'm now just going to quote from this guy, Eric Siddle, because it sort of describes not just what George Gascon is doing in L.A., but what we've seen in New York, what we've seen in St. Louis, what we've also seen in San Francisco. And I'm happy to say also that Chesa Boudin, the DA in San Francisco, is also facing a recall. So it's going to send a message um, that these Soros-backed DAs, these far-left DAs, uh, are alienating even the Democratic constituencies that they that put them into, into office. So back to Eric Siddle, vice president of this group called the Los Angeles Association of Deputy District Attorneys. He goes, quote, one of the first things Gascon did was to create a set of directives, in other words, internal rules that DAs are supposed to follow, and some of these rules directly contradicted California state law. So, for example, one rule, he says, is we could not file uh, strikes pursuant to the three strikes law. So California has, listen, three strikes and you're out. But according to Gascon, don't do that. Don't, don't identify the strikes so we don't get to three. So essentially, Gascon is unilaterally repudiating an existing California law. And Siddle continues, and the three strikes law is a mandatory law. It's something that prosecutors don't have the discretion to ignore. A second violation, says Siddle, is Gascon's alleged order for prosecutors to dismiss existing charges that he, Gascon, personally disagreed with. So even though there are charges filed and they're filed by local DAs, Gascon goes, I don't like that one. I, I don't really think that's, that's, so you drop it. Now, this is again, um, according to Siddle, he continues, whole sections of the penal code are no longer enforceable. He goes, and this is a serious problem. We can't just void sections of the law. In effect, what he's doing is making things legal by not enforcing them. So again, Gascon has become sort of a, uh, um, on his own discretion, deciding, yeah, this law, I think we're going to uh, apply that one. I don't think we're going to. And so all of this, by the way, these are not like random errors that fall on both sides of the net. Gascon is essentially the criminal's favorite DA. 
and he is the crime victim's ultimate nightmare. So this is a guy that is bad news. Uh, it's just the sheer stupidity of the Democratic voters that put him into office. It is the slow process of realizing just how bad he is. A lot of times people don't realize right away because you know what? My home wasn't robbed. My car wasn't break, broken into. Nobody stuck a knife in my back. So it takes a lot of victims to be shrieking out there for the ordinary guy to finally pay attention and go, well, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't have voted for this guy. I mean, yeah, it's time to recall him. So this is the, the, the Democrats, I would say, very gradually waking up, uh, sleepily pulling themselves out of their beds and recognizing that some of the people that they've put in office are downright bad guys. Everyone should have the right to free speech, but sadly, the big tech monopoly has instead opted for silencing tactics and censorship. To fight back against big tech's control of the internet, I use ExpressVPN. Big tech giants make their money by tracking your searches, video history, everything you click on, by building a profile on you and then selling off your sensitive data. You use the ExpressVPN app on your computer or phone. You anonymize much of your online presence by hiding your IP address. ExpressVPN encrypts your data so no one can see it. What I like most is the simplicity. It just takes one click to protect all your devices. That's why ExpressVPN is rated number one by Business Insider. Let's stop allowing big tech to revoke our rights to free speech. Secure your internet with the VPN I trust for online protection. Visit expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Dinesh. You'll get three extra months free with my exclusive link. Go to expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. Hey guys, I'm really happy to welcome to the podcast Tamika Hamilton. I've met Tamika a few times. I've been out and spoken with her at conferences and, and for her. And uh, she's running for Congress in California's third congressional district. She served on active duty in the U.S. Air Force for over 14 years, deployed to the Middle East. Her husband, Ray, is a also a veteran and now a local police officer. Tamika, thanks for joining me. It's good to see you again, even if remotely. And um, let me start by asking you about um, how you became a Republican. Was it something that happened naturally or was there a kind of moment of awareness or of conversion? Yes. Hi, Dennis. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it was naturally, you know, being a conservative was just natural to me. I was raised in a traditional family um, home. Uh, while we didn't talk a lot about politics, you know, but when it came time to vote, it was just a natural thing to vote uh, conservative. So uh, no, no uh, dramatic story. Sorry. Now, you're um, you've had a military career and then you decided to run for Congress. You came really close the last time you got, I believe, 46 percent of the vote uh, and that not in a not in a particularly Republican district. So this is kind of what I want to talk to you about, which is what is a way for Republicans and conservatives to compete in districts that are swing districts or moderate districts? What is your strategy? So my strategy, and that's a really great question, and my strategy is the ground. Uh, I tell people all the time, you know, winning races is about peer-to-peer, -peer, pressing the flesh, phone calls, and sending mail. And um, and that's what we have done here in this district to be effective. And uh, and we got really close to beating a 50-year incumbent, first time running. Um, and now we're on target to win this year because of uh, the foundation that we laid in 2020. Now... When you when you make your case to the voters, um, how do you frame the Republican message? Do you do it differently from the kind of traditional Republican message that you hear uh, in the media? Or uh, how do you pitch the case to a voter? Let's say I'm a skeptical voter. I've heard the Republicans are the party of the rich. I've heard Republicans are the party of white supremacy. Uh, how would you how would you break through to someone who's kind of picked those sorts of themes up from the media? So uh, one of the things that's really surprising is that that's not what I get when I go door to door. Uh, there, we're talking about the kitchen table issues, and I always put the focus on 
what they have going on and then what I want to do. Um, and then, oh, and I just so happen to be Republican. And so a lot of times they are taken back by me being Republican, uh, but not, you know, too often. And then they make a decision on whether or not they want to vote for me uh, because they actually saw me. And, you know, building a relationship in these communities is, is what it takes, especially in a district like this, and to, to get uh, to get the Republicans to win. You have to just build a relationship. And that's where and that's where it starts. You made the point to me that Republicans have tended to, you know, downplay or somewhat ignore, particularly the black vote. Well, how can Republicans, I mean, Trump did a little bit better with black communities, but we're still a long way from being competitive uh, in the African-American community. Do you think Republicans can make deeper inroads and how? Yes. Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, Republicans go off the of data when it comes to um, connecting with uh, communities in general. You know, they look at the data. This is what the data says. And this is where this is where we're going to pursue, you know, putting the most effort. Right. Uh, but in order for you to get uh, what we where we need to be and um, especially with the black vote, we're going to have to step outside of that and, and, and challenge ourselves. And if we say we care, if we say we have the solutions, then we need to be um, going in those underserved communities communities and making the case and again sticking to the kitchen table issues and and focusing on what's in front of you i'm the candidate this is what i want to do and what are your issues and how can i help now republicans have not emphasized in general identity politics who try to run sort of as a colorblind if you will party as if race doesn't really matter the democrats do the exact opposite they italicize mm -hmm. and highlight race do you think the Republicans have the right approach or do you think that there's nothing wrong for Republicans to practice a little bit of identity politics, at least to say, hey, listen, we're a party with that's a big tent. We've got a lot of people who look like like America and look like you. How do you play on this particular issue? Yeah, and that's another great question. It's something that you and I've talked about before. It's like it's marketing. You know, um, I think that uh, when we talk about identity politics, a lot of that is political theater um, that's, you know, played up so that there can be like this disconnect with Republicans actually talking to black voters, Hispanic voters that don't traditionally vote for them. And um, and we there's nothing wrong with saying, OK, this is a this is a group that needs X, Y, Z, because every community is something different. And and Donald Trump did a really amazing job in trying to build those coalitions. And so that is a model I think that people should look at, um, you know, in, in respective districts that are like, like mine. You know, um, it's not there's nothing wrong with marketing to um, specific groups. It's just it's really not. And and we need to change that. And I think part of what you're saying is there's nothing wrong also with Republicans um, trying to make an effort to sh to have a lot of black and hispanic candidates so that blacks and hispanics can see hey listen this is a party mm -hmm. in which i can feel at home in which we are not only asked to be members but we also can participate in the leadership absolutely i, I will tell you when i first walked into my republican central committee meeting no one looked like me i and i'm probably, and I'm still the only black woman in a lot of these groups and uh, because they don't do outreach. And some of these, some of these organizations are in the middle of the hood and they still do not outreach to the community. Like how, how is that even possible? And so, you know, that's, um, that's on us, that's on the Republican party. And, you know, and the other thing I would add is that I did not get into this because someone tapped me on my shoulder. Someone asked me to run, you know, every candidate is kind of out there on their own. You know, when you see the Republican Party kind of going, um, doing a lot of support and pushing a candidate, that's probably, at, that's after they win. That's after they've already been there, you know, and they want to keep them there. Um, but a lot a lot of candidates, 90% of them are out on their own and and uh, and working really hard to um, get that name ID, raise the money. That's, all, that's what I'm doing. Like, I'm not currently supported by the party, even though I, and when I say supported, I mean, like in a, the big tent, like, you know, in DC, you know, I'm not, I haven't gotten that big DC support yet, but um, locally I've been endorsed, you know, um, the community around me is supporting me, even Democrats. And so again, this is about making those inroads and taking chances um, because in order for us to expand and grow, evolve, we have to step out of that, uh, that normal comfort zone because we're going to, we're not going to last long going the way we're going. Tamika, you're on the front line and you're doing a good job. I really wish that this time you can cross the finish line and be successful um, because I think your message is particularly important and you're showing the way for Republicans to win in districts that are not traditionally Republican. Thanks very much for joining me on the podcast. 
Thank you so much. And and tell you, you and I would just like to add, uh, go to my website, vote to make dot org uh, and go check out my website and support if you can. Please do. We all know it's really important to eat fruits and eat veggies, and we eat, need to eat a certain amount, but most of us don't for whatever reason. And happily, there's kind of an easy way to do this. Debbie and I are now hooked. It's called Balance of Nature, and here we go. It's got the fruits in one bottle and the veggies in another. Um, we take three capsules of each. They go down really easy, no problem swallowing. They smell great. And uh, Debbie also swears by this. This is the balance of nature of fiber and spice. Debbie goes, it's, this is what keeps me regular. And she says it also helps with her acid reflux. So this is stuff that's really good for you. Invest in your health. Invest in your life. Join me. Experience the balance of nature difference for yourself for years to come. For a limited time, all new preferred customers get an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first balance of nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. There is a difference today in politics between the way that men vote and the way that women vote. It's typically called the gender gap. Uh, men tend to lean more Republican. Women tend to lean more Democratic. And a lot of times an election hinges on, because there are roughly the same number of men and women, whether the gender gap is bigger on the men's side for Republicans or bigger on the female side for, for Democrats. Now, there's a very interesting article. Uh, sometimes I dive into the academic literature. This is from the International Political Science Review, written by two people I respect. They're sort of, they lean left, but they're fair-minded scholars. Their names are Ronald Engelhart, Engelhart and Pippa Norris. And uh, this is a study of the, of the gender gap, not just in the United States, but also in Europe. And they make the interesting point that women used to be conservative. Women used to lean right. So the question that they're asking, and they don't fully answer it, but they raise it, is why is it that women who used to lean right for decades are now leaning left? What happened? What's the change? And let's look at some of the data. Apparently, um, when they looked at both the United States, this is going all the way back to the time when women were given the vote. For a number of decades, women leaned uh, Republican. They voted more for Republicans than they did for Democrats. And this was even, by the way, in the FDR time when, of course, the, the Democrats were winning elections at the presidential level pretty decisively. But uh, Pippa Norris and uh, Engelhardt say that this was also true in Europe, that by and large women tended to vote for center-right parties in Western Europe. For example, in places like Italy and Germany, they would vote for the Christian Democrats over the labor or left-wing or socialist parties. Um, and they also point out, for example, that, um, that if you look at things like church attendance, uh, in Europe, women tend to go to church more than men. And th so these were the factors that were seen to make women more conservative. Also, I think if you look at things just from a very broad, almost sort of Darwinian perspective, you discover that, that women are more risk averse than men. They take less risk. Um, they're more religious than men. They're also more conscientious in getting things done, uh, detail oriented. I think <laughs> Debbie's like, <laughs> yes, indeed. In this family, that's certainly true uh, than men. So, the, but the point is, all of these are indices that point in a more conservative direction. And so, you have kind of a mystery, which is that somehow, um, uh, and this this is back to the the study for a moment. In the fifties and sixties, women are more conservative. Then somehow in the 70s, they kind of move toward the middle. And then starting in the 80s and 90s, and all the way continuing to now, women are now sort of on the left end of the spectrum, at least on average. And the article, as I say, doesn't really resolve the question of why, but I want to offer a kind of theory of why, which goes back to a conversation years ago that I had with a political strategist who made a startling observation to me based upon the data that he was familiar with. And what he said was, he said, look, by and large, he says, if you show me a married woman, woman with kids, that woman is going to be almost surely Republican. Not always, but most of the time. He goes, you find, you find me a married woman with no kids? Leaning Republican. You find a divorced woman? In the middle. You can't really say. You find a single woman? Leaning Democratic. And he goes, you find a single mom with kids? You can almost surely predict that's a Democratic voter. 
And so if this kind of bell curve, if this spectrum is right, which I think it is, it really gives you the clue to solving this problem. The reason that women have moved left over these decades is because the traditional family has broken down. The traditional family, while it's intact, the majority of women were in traditional families. They were moms who had kids and they voted consequently more right wing, more to the right. Then as you began to see rising rates uh, of divorce, that began to push the women as a group toward the political center on average. And then as the number of single women, i.e. I, women who never married, and also women who are, who are single moms with kids, you now begin to see the desire, well, I need sort of a provider. It's no longer going to be the husband per se. Maybe it's going to be the government. So suddenly these new factors come into play in which you would almost argue that the government is taking the place of the provider. In fact, the government is seen as a more steady provider than some kind of a, you know, ne'er-do-well type of provider who may be here today, gone tomorrow. And so I think that this welfare state dependency factor begins to kick in. And since more women are falling into that kind of cohort, this is part of the explanation, maybe not the full explanation, but part of the ex explanation for why women who used to lean right of center now lean the other way. Who likes aches and pains? Well, nobody, but who knows how to get rid of them? Not everybody. Fortunately, there's now a 100% drug-free solution. It's called Relief Factor. Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation, and inflammation is the source of aches and pains. Now, the vast majority of people who try Relief Factor order more. Why? Because it works for them. Debbie's a true believer in Relief Factor. It's been a total game changer for her. It's relieved the pain caused by her frozen shoulder. Uh, Debbie knows if she doesn't take it regularly, the pain is going to come right back. So she goes, I'm not going to be without this again. Being able to lift her arm exercise is all very important to her. Relief Factor is the tool she needs. She's glad she's got it. You too can benefit. Try it for yourself. Order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of only $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to find out more about this offer. That number again, 833-690-7246 or go to relieffactor.com. Feel the difference. When we last left um, Dante, he was um, at just gone past the gates of hell. He had seen in the outer precincts of hell, the so-called neutrals, the people who couldn't decide, never make a choice, never commit themselves. And as I mentioned, Dante gives them the anonymity they deserve. He doesn't name any of them. But now we're in Canto IV, uh, which is the, um, the circle of hell that is called uh, limbo. Dante doesn't use that term, but it's the place where you have the virtuous pagans, the virtuous pagans. Who are the virtuous pagans? These are the good guys who are um, who lived before Christ. They weren't Christian. In fact, they didn't know about Christ. And um, they are here where they don't suffer any severe punishment, but they also feel a sense of weariness, of exhaustion, and they don't have hope. So in that sense, they are part of the abandon all hope, ye who enter here. They, Dante presents these as sort of good people, good in the human sense. They uh, have been pursuers of truth and of knowledge, but they don't have the Christian revelation. And so they, they don't get the final knowledge that they seek. And this is really why they're, they're always groaning and sighing because their efforts to get somewhere are always falling short. And the problem, of course, with being in hell is that they fall short now eternally. You'll never get to the place that you want to go. By the way, Virgil himself, Dante's guide, belongs here. He is an inhabitant of limbo, of the circle of the virtuous pagans, the outer ring of hell. And he's been temporarily asked to go on this mission with Dante through really all of hell and will seem virtually all of um, purgatory. But when that ends, Virgil will come back here uh, into, his, uh, into his circle. Who's in the circle? Well, it's a grand tour of a lot of interesting characters. By the way, Dante doesn't, you know, distinguish between people who actually lived and some characters in books, mythical characters, if you will. Dante treats them all as real. And so you go through hell and who do you see? Well, you see Plato, 
Plato was, of course, a real person. Socrates also. Uh, but you also see people like Aeneas. Aeneas is the hero of Virgil's Aeneid. There he is in the fourth. Um, he is in Canto IV in the circle of the virtuous pagans. Uh, you find uh, the uh, pre-Socratic philosopher Thales. Uh, the, um, you find Seneca, the Roman uh, writer. Hector, who is the fictional um, hero, uh, one of the heroes of the Iliad, he's in there. Homer, Horace, Ovid. And, um, but then you find something interesting. You find that there were people in this circle of the virtuous pagans who are no longer in hell. And you have to stop for a moment and go, wait a minute, what? I, I thought hell was eternal. I thought abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Once you get in, you can't get out. Well, as it turns out, and this is how complex Dante is and how interesting, there's an exception to this rule. What's the exception? Well, the exception turns out to be the faithful Jews of the Old Testament who didn't know about Jesus. In that sense, they too would fall into this camp of not being saved. But Jesus apparently went into hell and got them out. Now, this is not directly in the Bible, but it actually is in a Christian tradition going all the way back to the beginning. It's called the harrowing of hell. This is the basic idea. And I can cite the lines from the creed. This is the Nicene Creed. On the third day, he descended into hell. Um, oh, he descended into hell and on the third day he rose again. So apparently Jesus was three days in hell. What was he doing? Well, he was getting out the virtuous. He was getting out the faithful Jews uh, who um, were taken up into heaven. So this is the only case we can find. There's one more case, which I'll mention in a second, of somebody in hell who actually got out. They were temporary inhabitants of hell. Uh, who's the other case? Interestingly, Dante. Dante doesn't, even though Dante goes through the gates of hell, abandon all hope ye who enter here, Dante is not like everybody else. Dante is, in fact, going back uh, to his normal life uh, after he's done. So he's an exception. Now, Virgil, interestingly, died himself, the real Virgil, in 19 BC. And there's a very interesting message where Virgil says to Dante, he goes, you know, this harrowing of hell, this this event in which Jesus came down here and took out the faithful Jews and took them with him to heaven, he goes, that occurred shortly after I got here. So Dante is now referring to Virgil, who exper apparently experienced this event called the harrowing of hell. And a final little twist, uh, a little detail that I think should not go unnoticed, as Dante is making a list of all these guys he's running into, Homer and Horace and Hector, he also mentions two Muslims. Wait, what? He mentions Aver uh, Averroes and he mentions Avicenna. These are two Islamic philosophers who, by the way, were, as far as we know, devout Muslims. They believed in Allah. Um, and what are they doing here with the virtuous pagans? Well, I think what Dante is saying is that these guys were not known for being mullahs or Islamic fanatics. No, they were philosophers. And they were philosophers who engaged uh, with the same themes that occupied people like Thomas Aquinas. So they were struggling to get a better understanding of God. And so Dante doesn't see them as Muslims per se. Uh, he sees them as philosophers in the same category as other philosophers who are right here with the other virtuous pagans. So we see here how Dante is a, uh, takes a very interesting view on topics like, is there salvation or even the possibility of salvation for non-Christians? He makes us think very um, very hard about where people actually belong. He's forcing us to second guess his own judgments. And of course, his own judgments are, uh, are judgments that will be ultimately decided not by uh, us and not by Dante, but by God himself. Imagine the lifelong impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, Picture yourself stepping foot in iconic locations right out of Scripture. Join Dr. Sebastian Gorka and Dinesh D'Souza on this life-enriching Israel tour, November 30th through December 9th, 2022. For more information, call 855-565-5519 or visit StandWithIsraelTour.com. We're now going to turn to um, Canto V, which is um, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, canto in the Divine Comedy. And I'm going to take this one a little bit slow because in, not only is it important in itself, but it gives us a real idea of how Dante views sin in general, 
punishment in general. So it becomes a kind of preview for the entire uh, moral structure of the uh, Divine Comedy. Uh, it's kind of funny as I was uh, thumbing through my Canto V a moment ago, Debbie got a, says, hey, look at this. On, uh, we got this message through the website. I'm just going to read it. Please compile and release the Dante discussions as a self-contained video recording. I'd love to listen to them all in sequence. Good stuff. Well, I'm delighted because, um, because you know, I, I sometimes hesitate about doing these uh, historical and philosophical kind of excursions, uh, wondering if in a political podcast or people are like, why is Dinesh even talking about all this stuff? I, I see it as a nice compliment to the other stuff that I that I talk about. And I I don't think I can right now figure out how to put all this put all the Dante material together. I mean it's all there and I typically have it toward the end of each podcast. So it's pretty easy to find. But maybe sometime when I can I'll get around to figuring out how to thread them together to create a kind of sequence of videos that you can watch one after the other. Well, in Canto V, we're dealing now with the um, with the Canto of the Lustful, the Lustful. And uh, to remind you, in Dante's schema of the Inferno, you have three types of sins. You have the sins of incontinence or concupiscence, and Dante uh, classifies those as the mildest sins. Not they're serious enough to get you into hell, so don't they're not mild, but they are milder than the second category of sins, which is the sins of violence, uh, violence against others. And, uh, but as it also turns out, violence against self. And then finally, the sins of treachery and betrayal and fraud. And those for Dante are the worst sins, the ultimate uh, corruption of the mind. So you can think of the sins of concupiscence, this category we're going to talk about now, as the triumph of desire over reason and will. So for Dante, we humans are divided into sort of three parts. There's passion or desire, there's reason or intellect, and there's will. And you can almost think of will as the referee, the umpire, arbitrating between reason and desire. And ultimately for Dante, what you do is a matter of choice. You make that choice. And as we'll see here, the Canto of the Lustful, what you have are sinners, and we'll meet one in particular, a woman named Francesca, Francesca da Rimini. And the essence of her unrepentance, her refusal to repent for her sin, remember, if you repent for sins, however grave, that's going to move you right out of hell uh, and into either purgatory or into heaven, depending on the, on the circumstance. But the sinners in hell never repent. They can't repent. And this inability to repent shapes who they are. Um, and, and even in hell, they're holding out, justifying what they did. And the way they justify it is they act as if it was not a choice. I couldn't help myself. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Now, in Dante's geography of hell, very interestingly, you'll find that the punishment, I won't just say fits the crime, but reflects the fulfillment of what the sinner actually wants. And so as Dante comes into hell, what he sees is he sees these souls, evil spirits, he doesn't hesitate to call them, and they're being blown from side to side. They're being buffeted. Dante compares them to large birds that spread their wings and get caught in air pockets where they are thrown from one side to the other. Sometimes from a long ways away, they appear to be beautifully in control. But no. As you get closer, you see that the birds are out of control. They're being tossed uh, back and forth by the wind. <clears throat> so this is what Dante calls an infernal storm, an infernal storm. So who's in this, um, who's in this uh, circle of hell? Well, <clears throat> Cleopatra is in here and uh, Dido, who is the heroine of the Aeneid. Uh, Dido, by the way, is abandoned by <clears throat> Aeneas, she commits suicide. Uh, she is uh, someone who, quote, died for love, says Dante. Achilles is here. And if you read the, uh, <clears throat> the um, Iliad, you find that Achilles was angry because he had a concubine, Briseis, and uh, he's being denied the services of the concubine. So he's in the circle appropriately of the lustful. Paris. 
who spirited away Helen of Troy and began the um, uh, tumult that led to the uh, Trojan War. He's here. So um, Dante sees all these guys. He mentions Dido a couple of times, but he doesn't talk to her. He, um, we, we see her Dante style. You see a bunch of people, you zoom in, uh, you zoom into one or two, and then Dante will talk sometimes to only one. And the one that he talks to is a woman named, as I said, Francesca. Now, Francesca is not somebody who's famous like Dido or Cleopatra. She's somebody who had local fame. She was involved in a kind of, well, you'd have to say kind of a sex scandal in Dante's own time. And it was a very kind of like sordid, torrid sex scandal, which I'll just describe. And uh, then next time, by the way, I'm not going to talk about Dante Monday or Tuesday. I'm doing special episodes those two days. So we're going to pick this up on Wednesday. We'll talk more about Francesca's story and Dante's reaction to the story. But here, for here I just want to kind of give you the facts. Basically, Francesca is a woman um, in Florence who is involved with a genuinely torrid love affair with a man named Paolo. Now, Paolo, it turns out, is not her husband. In fact, Paolo is her brother-in-law. So here's Francesca, this beautiful woman, and she is sort of doing it with her husband's brother. Uh, the husband's brother apparently discovers them in bed uh, and immediately kills them both. Uh, and so they die, if you will, in the act and unrepentant. And both of them are right here in hell, in the circle of the lustful. Uh, Paolo's standing right behind Francesca, and he sort of appears to be writhing his body in a certain kind of torment. He too is being buffeted from side to side. Uh, but the only one that Dante speaks to is Francesca. Uh, and the content of that conversation, extremely important and interesting, is something we'll get to next time. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.